It's a, it's a pleasure to be here in beautiful uh, Faro. So um, before I get into the talk, I wanted to acknowledge some of my collaborators. This is joint work with Alejandro Moda and Coleman Allman from Sandia National Labs, as well as Greg Flippo, who was a summer student we worked with from Caltech. Um, so this talk is going to have really two uh, main parts. So um, the first part is going to be um, introducing our Schwartz alternating formulation for concurrent multi-scale coupling for quasi-statics, which is where this work began. Um, so that'll be about half of the talk. And then um, the, the last half is going to be some more recent work that we've been doing on extending that formulation to the case of dynamics. Um, so, of course, before I get into kind of the, the, the main part of the talk, I wanted to give a little bit of motivation that we have um, for, for multi-scale coupling. Um, so, specifically, I'll start with talking about why we're interested in concurrent multi-scale coupling. Um, so, the sorts of uh, systems that we're interested in simulating um, often have um, large-scale structural failure. Uh, Large-scale structural failure frequently originates when you have a small-scale phenomenon like a defect or a micro-crack which grows quickly in an unstable manner and leads to the large-scale structural failure. So an example would be this roof failure of a Boeing 737 aircraft that occurred due to fatigue cracks. And um, basically, because of the tightly coupled interaction between the small and the large scales in these um, scenarios, um, it's really essential to um, use concurrent methods to understand and predict um, the behavior of these sorts of systems. And so by concurrent, I mean essentially two-way coupled methods. And what we've seen is that if we don't use these concurrent or two-way coupled methods, we don't always get an entirely physical solution. So um, let me expand a little bit on our requirements beyond having the, the concurrent um, multi-scale coupling. Um, the other requirements we have are listed here on the slide. So we're looking for methods that are easy to implement into existing massively parallel HPC codes that we have, uh, methods that are scalable, fast, and robust on real engineering problems that we're targeting. Um, we're looking for a method that would simplify the task of meshing complex geometries. So um, you know, if you have something like this, where you have a small scale and a large scale, meshing this conformally can be very um, hard and, and time consuming. So ideally, we would decompose this into the small scale, the large scale, mesh those two things separately, and then use the method to glue the scales back together. Um, we, of course, don't want any non-physical artifacts introduced by the coupling. And ideally, we would have some theoretical convergence properties or guarantees. So um, as the title of the talk suggests, so we're proposing to do this coupling using um, a formulation that um, leverages the Schwartz alternating method for domain decomposition. Um, so this method, I think many of you have probably heard of, it's been around for quite some time, um, proposed in 1870 by Hermann Schwartz for solving the Laplace equation on an irregular domain. Uh, and it's based on a very simple idea where um, if you want to solve your problem on a complex domain, you decompose it into simpler subdomains, um, and you use those solutions on those simpler subdomains to iteratively build your solution on the more complex domain. So um, the basic algorithm is written here in words. I'll, I'll describe it in the context of this um, canonical picture with two subdomains. Um, it extends to more than two subdomains. Um, so basically, uh, the way it works is you, you first solve your equation on omega 1, the first domain. You're going to use whatever boundary conditions are prescribed on the outer boundary. We don't worry about the inner boundary in the initial step. Uh, once we solve this, we go to omega 2. We're going to solve our problem in omega 2. We do the same thing. We use um, boundary conditions on the outer boundary. And for this inner boundary, gamma 2, what we can do is we can take the solution we just obtained in omega 1, interpolate it onto gamma 2, and use that to define the boundary condition there. So then um, you, know, you go back to omega 1 and you repeat, and you keep doing this until the solutions match to a certain overlap, um, a certain uh, tolerance within the overlap region. And so not surprisingly, you need to um, have the overlap region be non-empty non to convert. So where this method commonly uh, arises is in the linear solver literature, where it's often used as a preconditioner for Karlov iterative methods uh, for solving linear algebraic equations. And the new idea here was to actually use the method as a discretization method for solving PDEs. So let me kind of get into how we do that, starting with the quasi-static case. 
Um, so this is the, the basic, um, we call this the full Schwartz, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit later, uh, algorithm for the quasi-static case. And essentially what this is, is, is exactly what I just described in words, where you're you know, solving in one domain, solving in the other sub domain, going back and forth like that, and the information is propagating through the boundary uh, conditions. And so as a multi-scale coupling method, this approach has a number of advantages. It's a very simple method conceptually. It lets you couple um, regions with different non-conformal meshes, different element types, different levels of refinement. I'll, I'll show that shortly. Um, you can use different solvers in different subdomains if you wish. You can use different material models um, as well um, under some conditions. And you do get the concurrent coupling that we're, we're interested in. Um, it turns out that this formulation has um, a lot of nice uh, theory. So in our 2017 paper, which is cited here at the bottom, we uh, derived a proof of convergence of the, of the method for the finite deformation quasi-static nonlinear PDE uh, given by this energy functional. So these are basically um, you know, static uh, mechanics type of problems. The conditions are that that energy functional be quasi-convex meaning basically that your single domain problem is well posed and also that you have a non-empty overlap. And the details can be found in this paper of the proof if you're interested. It does leverage some of the analysis done in the first half of the past century by um, Sobolev and Michlin for the case of um, linear elliptic uh, equations. Okay, so this is kind of an eye chart, uh, but this is not intended to be um, read. So, so in, if you look in our paper, you'll find that there are four variants of Schwartz there. Um, they're kind of different formulations, different implementations. They, they vary in, um, you know, the, these ones here, they um, combine the Newton and the Schwartz loop into a single loop. Um, they vary in how boundary conditions are imposed, um, what tolerances we use. Essentially today I'm going to be focusing on the full Schwartz, which is that classical algorithm I described earlier. And the reason for this is this is, it turns out to be the most performant method. Um, we get monotonic convergence, we get the, the theoretical convergence properties that I, um, I mentioned. Um, if you're interested in some of the other, the other versions, you can check out the paper. Um, so all the results I'm going to show um, are for an implementation we did within a code called Albany. Um, so Albany is, a, is an open source parallel C++ multi-physics fine element code. Um, started at San Diego, we have a lot of collaborators, including a lot of academics are, are developing it and using it right now. Um, it's available on GitHub. Um, it has a component-based design that uses largely these Trilinos libraries, um, which are also on GitHub. And we're using here the, the LCM suite within Albany, which stands for Laboratory of Computational Mechanics. Um, so this has really a wide variety of equations, tools, um, material models for, for solid mechanics problems. And then for the um, interpolation in, in parallel from um, one domain onto the boundary of the other domain, um, we use a library called DTK Data Transfer Kit, which is another open source library developed at Oak Ridge National Lab. Okay, so I'm gonna show um, three examples. Um, they're gonna get um, more advanced as I go through, so I'll start with just a proof of concept verification problem and go all the way to production. Um, so this is the verification problem, very simple cuboid problem. We have um, two cuboids shown here with a square base. Um, we're gonna pull on them and this is gonna stretch. Um, the Hookian type of material model is prescribed. So um, again, the purpose here is verification. Um, the, what we're looking at here is um, convergence of the method as we change the overlap and the refinement. Uh, and so this plot is showing that we have a linear convergence of the method, which is consistent with the theory. And then here you can see that um, as you increase the overlap volume fraction, you get a, a faster linear convergence, which is consistent also with the, the theory. Um, and then in terms of errors, we computed errors um, with respect to a reference solution on a single domain, and the errors are 10 to the minus 14 for displacement, 10 to the minus 13 for, um, for the stresses, so, so this doesn't introduce any significant coupling error. Um, Next example, this is more sophisticated notch cylinder. So this is the geometry. Again, we're gonna pull this actually from both sides and it's gonna stretch. And um, kind of the natural thing you would wanna do here is you would wanna put a fine mesh in the middle and a coarse mesh away from the notch. So here we're testing actually different element types. We're gonna put tets here in the middle and hexes away from, from the middle. And so let's see if this movie works. Let's see if it's black. Oh, oh good, okay. So here's a, a movie showing uh, you the solution. So the left one here is the displacement magnitude. The right one is the, one of the Cauchy stress components. And so you get a nice smooth um, you know, solution, um, you know, smooth transition and propagation of, this, of the solution from one domain onto the other. And the errors here are about 
1%, and if you actually visualize the errors, which is what this is doing, um, you find that the errors are actually not due to the coupling, it's due to the fact that the reference solution we're using to compute the errors with respect to can reproduce this curve geometry better than um, each of the meshes for the Schwartz domains. Um, we can also couple different material models under some conditions. So here we're trying a coarse, uh, sorry, an elastic material model in the coarse region uh, here and an elastoplastic material model in the fine region. And so when you're doing different materials, you need to be careful um, that the material models are consistent in the overlap region. And this is not surprising because the theory assumes the same material model. So this is just showing a, a, a good and a bad uh, domain decomposition. The good one, um, the overlap is far from the notch. You get a nice smooth solution because there's no plastic deformation in the overlap region. You, the, the, region the, the two models predict the same behavior there. Whereas if you put this too close, you'll get some, some adverse um, effects on conversions and some artifacts because of the models being um, conflicting within the overlap region. And um, the last example for quasi-statics is more of a, a production-like problem for us, laser weld specimen. This is also testing more than two subdomains. There are three subdomains here. And um, we're able to show a 50% reduction in the model size relative to a single domain simulation um, to get the same accuracy. And also near ideal linear speed up up to about 1,000 cores um, of, the, of the parallel implementation. Okay. So um, I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about dynamics, which is something we've been working on for the past um, a couple of years after doing the quasi-statics. So a little bit of an intro for the dynamics. When we started this, we, we looked in the literature. Um, there have been some Schwartz-like methods that we found um, out there. The ones that we found are based on space-time discretizations. And so what's nice about this is this lets you use uh, non-matching meshes in different time steps in different uh, subdomains. Um, unfortunately for us, we're really not able to use these kinds of methods because of the design of our codes and the size of the simulations we're, we're interested in. So here's the formulation that we uh, came up with um, for dynamics. Um, so I'll explain it in the context of this picture again. We have this domain decomposition. We're going to have a time step or an omega-1 with some time step, time step, or an omega-2 with, with some time step. They don't need to be the same. The last ingredient is what's called here and shown in blue controller time stepper, and this is kind of a misnomer. My colleague came up with this. I kind of don't like it, but um, this is a, basically a set of convenient checkpoints to facilitate the, um, the implementation of the method. I'll become clear, I think, when I explain the algorithm what's for. So you, you start lo by looking in the first controller time step. You're going to take the solution omega-1, advance it from um, T0 to T1 using whatever time integrator is prescribed and whatever time step you want to uh, use there. And in doing that, you're going to have to interpolate the solution from omega-2 onto gamma-1, not, not just in space, but also potentially in time. Um, then you go to uh, omega-2. You're going to, again, do the same thing. Um, again, you're going to need to interpolate from um, you know, omega-1 uh, omega to gamma-2 in this case. Once both of the domains have reached T1, you check for convergence. If the method's not converged, you return to step one and repeat. Uh, if the method is converged, you go to the next controller time step and you, you go back and repeat the procedure. And I emphasize this, this lets you use different integrators, different time steps um, within, within each domain. Um, in terms of theory for dynamics, um, it turns out that the quasi-static proof that I mentioned, and it's actually cited here from our paper, um, this extends naturally to dynamics if you use the same time step and conformal meshes um, in each of the subdomains. Of course, that's not the interesting case. So we are looking at extending the theory to the more general case currently. Um, what I really want to stress is that um, the numerical results suggest that there is a theory underlying this. We get very good um, results with the method and no, no artifacts um, that we've been able to um, observe. Uh, so dynamic uh, implementation, this is basically the same slide as before. Um, again, the same Albany code. We're using uh, a new package in Trilinus called Tempest for the time integration. We're using new mark type of steppers from there that we added. And one caveat of the implementation currently is that um, it doesn't let us use different time steps in different um, subdomains, but we're gonna, um, we're gonna change that in the, in the very near future. So um, again, as before, th three examples. I'm gonna start with you know, verification and go all the way to production. So first example, very simple problem, linear elastic wave propagation. We have this clamped beam um, shown there on the right. Um, we're gonna put a Gaussian initial, here, initial condition here shown in blue. Mm -hmm. 
And this is going to, um, you'll see on the next slide, there's a movie. It will kind of propagate and, and reflect. And eventually, you'll get this, this reflection mirror image of the Gaussian. And this is a very simple problem. It has an analytical solution. But it turns out it's a very stringent test for discretization methods. Because if you have um, artifacts that are introduced by the method, you will see them on this problem. And we're going to try all sorts of couplings, implicit, explicit, um, hextet, and so on. So a couple movies here. Let's see. Oh, what happened there? Oh, no, there it goes. OK. Uh, so these are just some movies showing the solution. This is for tet hex coupling with two subdomains shown in, in, in uh, green and, and red. Uh, Z displacement on the left, Z velocity on the right, and the single domain solution in blue. And um, the main point here is you don't see any artifacts that would be pervasive in other coupling methods. And that's, of course, in the IVAL norm. But if you, you can quantify this, you can compute errors, um, which is what this is doing with respect to the exact solution. And what we can show is that these errors are comparable to what you would have um, for a single domain discretization of a comparable resolution. Um, for this problem, total energy should be conserved, and, and indeed we, we get um, energy conservation with the, the Schwartz method. Um, example two, moving towards um, production, is a tension specimen. So it's similar to the notch cylinder problem. This is our geometry. Uh, it's a uniaxial aluminum cylindrical tensile, tensile specimen. Um, we're going to model it with an inelastic G2 material model, which is much more sophisticated than the other ones I showed. This is going to be pulled from both ends and, and stretched. We're going to put a hex mesh here in the outer part, our outer domain. And then this is a fine um, high order composite uh, tetrahedron, 10 node tetrahedron mesh um, in the middle uh, domain. And you can't see it here, but there's a very slight imperfection that's introduced in the middle to force this thing to neck exactly in the middle when it stretches. So here's the, the simulation. Um, this is with Schwartz, Y displacement on the left, nodal equivalent plastic strain on the right. You get the necking behavior that, that you expect. And I'm not showing it here, but this matches well with the single domain solution. And this takes about seven Schwartz iterations per time step to converge to a pretty tight tolerance. So that's really not, not very much. And then the last example, this is my, um, my production example. And so this is really representative of where we're going with this. These are the types of problems we want to solve. So problems with fasteners. In this case, we have bolts. So this is our computational domain. This is where you might find it in the real world. This was in my, in my neighborhood, a light post there. And we're going to put, um, make this outer part, which we call the parts, put, the, put a hex mesh there. In the, in the bolts, we're going to put um, uh, a fine composite TET 10 <coughs> mesh as before. And if you look at the solution, so we're applying a displacement here from left to right. This is a single domain solution with an all composite TET 10 mesh. This is the Schwartz solution. And these, these match quite well as this goes through. Um, they're virtually indistinguishable. And then moreover, um, if you look at the final deformed configuration, this matches kind of where you would see this in the real um, world. So you, know, you get this lift up here, uh, and, and just like you see there. And this was um, an experiment that someone we don't know did in a parking garage in San Francisco, but we were able to, to, to benefit from it here. Uh, okay. Um, so we can look at um, things like no liquid plastic strain uh, in the bolt. So you, this is concentratable. You'll expect these things to ultimately fail. And performance is very much of interest for these realistic problems. So this is showing number of Schwartz iterations as a function of time. So you, you start off with actually a, a lot of iterations. But then very soon, this, this goes down to about 9 or 10 Schwartz iterations. And that's actually um, really good, I think, given that the overlap region for this problem is incredibly small. So just to wrap up here, um, I talked about Schwartz um, uh, as, a, as a method for concurrent multi-scale coupling in quasi-statics and dynamics. Um, we're able to meet all the requirements I mentioned at the beginning, except we're still working on the theory for the, uh, the dynamics case. And then in terms of kind of what, where we're going with this, um, in addition to developing the theory for dynamics, we're working on a journal article on the dynamic Schwartz formulation that will hopefully be finished soon. Um, we're going to extend our dynamic implementation and test it in Albany to the case of different time steps. Um, we're, we've begun implementing this method in our production code at Sandia called Sierra Solid Mechanics. And this is actually a preliminary result for the tension specimen that's just from a couple weeks ago. This was surprisingly easy to, to implement in that code. And um, I think further down the line, it would be very interesting to extend the framework to allow for not just multi-scale, but also multi-physics uh, coupling. And so um, I'll stop here. These are references, and these are some of our papers, including um, the last one is, is going to hopefully be, be finished um, by the end of this fiscal year, as we said in our project plan. So I'll stop here. Thank you.